Chapter 20 Chalk and Cheese Harry Spider arrived at the Keefley main post office just a few minutes early because he didn't want to appear as eager as he was. He looked around and saw that there were quite a few other people waiting, but that was not unusual as it was the designated meeting place for all the local couples as it was attached to the multi-storey car park which had a very handy clock tower. One of the other lads was clutching a bunch of flowers and he wondered if he should have done the same. But nah, I don't think so, he thought. I mustn't appear too keen. It's best to play it cool. And anyway, I've done this sort of thing before, so I know what I'm doing. He was of course referring to Jennifer. She'd served her purpose well. After all, you don't learn to drive in a Rolls Royce, do you? And she must have known that one day I was going to move on to bigger and better things. I mean, it was obvious, wasn't it? He looked up at the clock tower and it showed 7.30. This was it. The agonising wait was over. The time had arrived. And although he was now a professional at this sort of thing, he still felt sick with nerves. He checked his reflection in the post office window, then glanced around. Some of the other couples had already met and were drifting away. Just wait when Victoria turns up. I can't wait to see the look on the other lads' faces when she walks over to me. They'll be so jealous. A few quick minutes later, and he looked up at the clock again, and it was now 7.35. She's a little late, but not to worry. A woman's prerogative and all that. So he checked his reflection again, and then stared up at the clock again. Then checked his reflection again, and then looked at the clock again, and then again, and again. He peered around the corner, but there was still no sign. He glanced around furtively, there were only three people waiting now. Mild panic began to set in. Shit. What if she don't turn up at all? What am I going to say to me friends? I'll never live it down. It was all going so horribly wrong. Eventually, he looked at the clock tower for the last time, and it was nearly five past eight and he was the only person stood there, and suddenly it hit him. She's not coming, and furthermore, she never had any intentions of ever coming. What a complete prat! His head dropped, and slowly he turned and walked away. He was completely gutted. What an idiot I've been! A stupid, arrogant idiot. How could I ever have even contemplated that she'd turn up? He looked down at himself. Look at the state of those shoes and those trousers. And look at her. Fantastic looking. Plenty of money. And what the hell do I have to offer her? Absolutely nothing. What a bloody stupid. Harry Spider, isn't it? Harry stopped dead in his tracks, and scared that this might be some kind of mirage, he didn't dare turn around. But then she spoke again. Hello, Harry. I read your note. Eventually he did look, and standing there in front of him was the vision he'd first seen in the back of the Mercedes. Only now she was there with him, and again it was all too much, and he blushed uncontrollably. Sorry I'm late, she said, with her full lips curling down at the edges. I was waiting for father to go to golf. You know how it is. Her blonde hair fell lightly onto the waist-length black leather jacket she wore over a blue summer dress. It was a striking combination that left Harry stunned, excited, panic-stricken and utterly speechless. 
Hello, it's me, Victoria. You do remember me, don't you? Remember her? Remember her? Jesus, how could I ever forget? His heart was threatening to burst from his chest and he wanted to sing and dance. But somehow he managed to resist the temptation and he tried to effectuate some kind of answer. Hi, he said in a ridiculously high-pitched tone. He cleared his throat and started again. <coughs> Oi, Victoria, I didn't think you were going to show. Lovely evening, ain't it? Phew, he managed to actually get some words out without incident this time. Only he had no idea why he sounded like Bert from Mary Poppins. Oh, please, Harry, do call me Vicky. Mother hates that. Oh, right, okay. So, where would you like to go? Um, Vicky? Her eyes open wide with anticipation, and like whirlpools, they drew him in. Surprise me, Harry, she whispered, and he was caught. The evening sun was still warm, with just a light summer breeze to gently air the night. It really was all just so perfect. And now a partially recovered Harry, after much deliberation, decided to show Vicky the nearest local beauty spot, Tinker's Woods. With the awkward preliminaries over, he felt more able to relax and the conversation became less strained and less Bert-like from Mary Poppins. And as they walked, they chatted much more easily. Gosh, Harry, it's very nice down here. From the road, you wouldn't think that such a place could possibly exist. Yeah, well, it's not all doom and gloom round here, you know. Yes, I can see that. And do you know something else, Harold? Um, uh, no, what? I never thought that I would be spending time with someone from a council estate. Mother would hate that if she ever found out. And she smiled conspiratorially and linked arms with his. But the comment aroused Harry's suspicion. You're not just here for that reason, are you, Vicky? Oh dear, no! I've got myself a paranoid one here. Don't worry, Mr. Paranoid. It was just a passing remark. All oh, right. Sorry, Victoria. Um, Vicky, said Harry, more than satisfied with the answer. That's okay, Harold. I forgive you. And she called upon her well-practiced and prettiest smile and then cast it in his direction. Now show me more of this Tinkle Woods. They'd had to walk through Harry's estate to get to Tinker Woods, and the surroundings had not exactly been picturesque. It wasn't entirely bad, but as with all such areas, there was the occasional bad apple, such as a neglected garden, or a boarded up window, or the odd burnt out car. And although Vicky hadn't mentioned any of this, he thought he'd better defend his neighbourhood anyway. So he paused for a moment and tried to arrange his words as eloquently as possible. You know something, Vicky? It's not where you come from. It's where you're going to that matters. And where are you going to, Harold? She asked immediately. Damn, he had absolutely no idea. He just thought it would sound good. Well, um, you know. No, I don't. So tell me. He hesitated for a few seconds, but then decided to break with tradition and actually tell her the truth. I want to be running my own business when I'm older. After all, there's no use in helping somebody else to get rich, is there? By doing what, Harold? Um, what? What type of business? Oh, right. He smiled awkwardly. Shit, I have no idea, he thought. Then, luckily, he caught sight of a rusty bicycle at the edge of the stream, and then 
and the idea came to him. Recycling. That's what I want to do. Vicky stopped and looked at him for what seemed like an age. But then a minor miracle. Recycling? Hey, what a super idea. That's so fashionable at the moment. Yes, that could work. Why don't you, Harold? I bet you could do it. Why don't you break away from all of your friends and get yourself a decent education and really go for it? You're obviously bright. You should channel it positively. Harry was taken aback. Jesus, Vicky, you sound like my, um, a social worker. He was trying to sound annoyed, but in truth, he was deeply flattered by her concern. Come on, Harry. You haven't answered my questions. He fought again, then decided to impress her even more. So off he went. Chances and expectations. That's what it all boils down to, you know, Vicky. And then he paused for dramatic effect. What do you mean by that? She asked, just as he knew she would. Well... You're expected to do well, because, well, you get the chances, and well, I don't, so I'm not expected to do, um, well. What a load of baloney, Harold. We're all born equal. Harry was again taken aback. She was not supposed to say that. This wasn't really going to plan. He had to pull something else out of the bag, so he did. We're only equal in the eyes of God, Vicky. And he then paused again for even more dramatic effect. And there are no gods walking this earth. That was a stunning statement, he thought. He was on a roll now, but not for long. Well, I'm sorry, but no, I don't agree. With will, determination, and a positive attitude, I'm quite sure that anybody could better themselves. So again, Harry tried to make her understand. You see, Vicky, what it is, is, there's no spare money knocking about round here. It all goes on hand-to-mouth living, so they don't have the luxury of being able to plan any kind of future because it's all mapped out before them. You know, predestination and all that. He felt he'd stated his case well and he'd helped her to understand the ways of the people of the estate and the dignity that most of them possessed. When an extraordinary piece of bad timing occurred, a cow trotted past them, its mount pretending to be Clint Eastwood. Vicky could only stare in disbelief as the unusual duo went by, and it became immediately obvious to Harry that nobody rode cows where Victoria came from. With her mouth wide open in astonishment, she tried to speak. What? what, what? What? What the fu- What the fu- What the fu- 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 Harry tried to make light of the situation. Don't worry, Vicky. You're not a losing 18. That's not really Clint Eastwood. Ha <laughs> ha. But alas, no joy. Vicky was still in shock, but again she tried to speak. What? Where? Why? But after a few seconds more, she regained her senses and actually managed to get a sentence out. Oh, what on earth is going on there, Harold? Why is a boy riding a cow? Harry knew he would have to explain, but he also knew that she would not like it. 
He tried to think of a way to break it to her gently, but he couldn't. So he just told her how it was. Well, as you can see, Vicky, that's a cow rider, and he's on a run. On a run? Well, where are they going? Well, they're on the way to the slaughterhouse. The slaughterhouse? Yes, I'm afraid so, said Harry, feigning sentiment. But why? Well, there's no easy way to put this, but it works out like this. For every cow a rider brings in, he gets ten quid. Vicky was incensed. Ten pounds? Ten lousy pounds? Is that all that poor cow's life is worth? Yeah, it's disgusting, isn't it? sighed Harry in his best patronising voice as he was amazed that anybody would care for a daft old cow. Well, can't you stop them? I could, but there's really not much point, because either way, it's going to end up as the meat in the sandwich, isn't it? But that's awful. How can you be so unmoved, Harold? Well, haven't you ever eaten beef, Vicky? Yes, of course I have. Well... Where do you think that came from? Well, probably not from some little street urchin thinking he's John Wayne. Clint Eastwood. John Wayne? Clint Eastwood? What does that matter? This is diabolical. Harry then tried to explain it as idealistically as he could. It's just a means to an end, Vicky. That's all. The farmer's insured, so he won't miss the odd cow. The slaughterman don't ask where it came from because he's getting it a bit cheaper. So everybody's happy. Except the cow. And that is the best advert for vegetarianism that I've ever seen. This really got Harry's goad. After all he'd told her about the estate and its people, still she did not understand the day-to-day -day struggle that most of them had to endure just to get by. He could not hold his tongue any longer, so he launched himself headlong into what at the time was a fairly new debate. Look, Vicky, when you're hard up and you're hungry, cows and vegetarianism -ism are not your priorities. No, they're obviously not. Yes, they're obviously not. Because the priority round here is feeding your family and surviving day to day as best you can. So to them, vegetarianismism is just a fad for rich, spoilt Western women who can afford their choice. I mean, how many vegetarians do you see in bloody Ethiopia, for God's sake? Well, that's not the point, is it, Harold? Well, it bloody wouldn't be, would it? thought Harry, as he could see it was hopeless to continue. Vicky was obviously very used to getting her own way, and she seemed to be arguing just for the sake of it, and he guessed that she probably gave her parents the same treatment. And quickly he realised Victoria was not the same as him, and God willing she never would have to be. Life's subtle influences had forged him into more of a down-to-earth pragmatist. Victoria's affluent and sheltered passage through life had decreed that she be an idealist. And because of this, she possessed a wonderfully untarnished enthusiasm for life, the likes of which Harry would never know. And if he wanted this date to continue, then there was nothing else he could do but accept who she was. So he exercised diplomacy and backed down. I suppose so, Vicky. And at the end of the day, it's each to his, or for the sake of another argument, her own. Yes, you're right, Harry. But from now on, I'm going to be... 
A vegetarian? Yeah, so am I, agreed Harry. At least until dinner time. Their first date continued, with the massive gulf in their upbringings already starting to show. But with the initial verbal sparrings over, they eventually settled down, and it emerged that they did share one common trait. They were both equally obstinate. But similarities and differences apart, he couldn't help but be influenced by Victoria. She was extremely bright and possessed an infectious personality, which made her very easy to get along with. In fact, too easy. And when they stopped at the old wooden bridge at the entrance to Tinker Woods, Vicky removed her jacket and placed it down for them to sit on, and then dangled her Jesus sandal clad feet into the cool of babbling water and admired the view. It's beautiful here, Harry. Yeah, it's not bad, is it? It's like a living and breathing painting. And then she looked him straight in the eyes and said in a cool, breathy voice, I bet you bring all your girlfriends here, don't you? Warmed by her show of concern, Harry grinned from ear to ear. Nah, of course not. I bet you do. A good-looking chap like you. I bet you've had loads of girlfriends, haven't you? Just the odd one or two, Vicky. And he blushed as his emotions accelerated into overdrive. Harry then decided that now was a good time to be not romantic. No, there's no romance to be found here. He decided to be manly. So he stood up, reached out for her hand and led her into the warmth of that summer's evening, an evening that would be etched in both their memories forever.